Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It is a new evening of ESMT CME online meetings. Welcome everyone. And this new clinical forum presented by Ain Shams University. This session will be uh, for clinical presentations by Ain Shams team, University, Ain Shams University team, and his, uh, their leader, Professor Hisham Sayyid. We are honored to have Professor Muhammad Sop as the moderator of this session, together with the leader of uh, Professor Hisham Sayyid uh, as two moderators of this great session. Professor Muhammad Sop is well known, and I would like especially to thank him for his continuous share. Uh, whatever we ask him to share uh, in this platform and in this continuous CME, meetings of uh, Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation. Professor Mohammed Sop is the Professor of Nephrology, Transplantation and Internal Medicine, Mansoura University and Mansoura Kidney Nephrology Center. He is well known, Professor Sop, and is the winner of Nile Prize and one of the major nephrology uh, eminent professors in Egypt, Arab world, African world, and international world. <clears throat> Professor Sobh is well known. I would like especially to thank him to be the moderator of this session. Uh, our second moderator is Professor Hisham Sayyid, Professor of uh, Nephrology and Internal Medicine and Shams University. He is the leader of his team today, of his university team, to present these cases. Professor Hisham Sayyid is the vice president of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology, the head of Nephro uh, ESNT uh, Hemodialysis chapter, and uh, the Afran, African uh, Association of Nephrology, Hemodialysis chapter uh, uh, president. Uh, and he is well known for us as the Hemodialysis Man of Africa, Egypt. And I would like to congratulate him specifically for his uh, last publications uh, accepted in the World Congress of Nephrology in the Hemodialysis as usual and welcome him to lead his team in this session. Welcome, Professor Sobh, and welcome, Professor Hisham Sayyid, to lead this meeting, and we expect to have a very interesting session full of information and clinical application. Thank you. Uh, please, Professor Sobh. Yes. Professor Muhammad Sobh. Yes. yes. Uh, OK. Uh, actually, uh, I'd, I'd like to express my thanks for you, uh, Professor Yasser Hamid, for your continuous uh, uh, efforts, successful efforts. Um, uh, uh, also, I'd like to thank, um, of course, Dr. Hisham Said, a well-known figure in the area of dialysis and nephrology. And I think today we will see a very successful meeting, inshallah. Okay. okay. You heard me, Professor uh, yes. Thank you for Professor all. Great, thank you for all. Always great team and great evening. Uh, thank you for the very eminent uh, moderator, our professor, Dr. Muhammad Sop, uh, one of the godfathers of nephrology in Egypt. And thank you, Professor <clears throat> Dr. Yasser, for your very kind introduction. One of the battery of the uh, CME and nephrology in Cairo. Today we will present three cases uh, presented uh, to our university hospital. And I think uh, the three cases are clinically different in presentation and diagnosis. For the sake of the time, we will have uh, the first case presented by uh, Dr. Ahmed Amara, one of the promising and one uh, of the very uh, active member of the nephrology team in Champs University. After each case, we will give a space for discussion and questions. And I think uh, uh, the three cases presented today probably one of the uh, very interesting field in nephrology. So let us uh, go, uh, Dr. Ahmed Amara, and we will uh, continue listening until the end. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to be here today with uh, my dear professors and colleagues in the ACNT Clinical Forum to present um, cases from our practice in um, Ain Shams University Hostel. I will start with the first case. 
Um, the case is about uh, 42 <laughs> years, 42 year old female patient, born and lives in Sudan. She is married with three offspring. Youngest is three years, housewife. She used to have regular cycles. She was referred to our uh, hospital for re-evaluation of um, impaired renal function diagnosed two weeks earlier in 5th of October, 2022. Um, patient was previously healthy with irrelevant past medical history and family history. Um, her condition started years ago in the early 2019, shortly after her last pregnancy, when she started suffering generalized fatigue throughout the day, skin darkness, especially and skin turgor skin creases, tights at his hand and the forearm, and ulceration of her fingertips, and the symptoms of renal phenomena as a form of um, color changes in exposure to cold. Also, she reported unintentional weight loss about 20 kilogram over um, four months duration. She sought medical advice in Sudan, and the investigation revealed a positive ANA and the positive anti-SSL70, and she was diagnosed accordingly to have systemic sclerosis. She was prescribed uh, MF 500 milligram twice daily, and uh, 30 milligram uh, uh, once daily for Reynolds phenomena, not for hypertension. And she reported being improved as regard to fatigue and skin tightness. And there was no history of arthralgia, no oral arthritis, no hair loss, no other skin rashes, no cough or dyspnea or lower limb edema. She was fine till August uh, 2021. She experienced a red point for another skin uh, lesion at her light leg at the chain of tibia. Uh, rapidly progressed <laughs> to painful ulcer of viruses age surrounded by cellulitis. She sought medical advice um, uh, also in Sudan and she was prescribed oral and topical antibiotics and also um, multiple surgical debridement were done for this ulcer. Um, in uh, March uh, 2022, she um, uh, underwent a biopsy from this skin lesion due to non-improvement, and the biopsy revealed um, biogenic granuloma. And uh, based on that, she kept on oral and topical antibiotics again. Five months later, in August 2022, patient came to Egypt for a second opinion as regard her skin condition. She sought medical advice with a dermatologist. He ordered arterial and venous topics that uh, came normal. And she diagnosed uh, with bioderma gangrenosum instead. And she was prescribed prednisolone 80 milligram per day, cyclosporin 100 milligram three times daily with bentoxifilin also three times daily. And MF was stopped then. And she also advised to receive the hyperbaric oxygen for better wound healing. <coughs> Uh, this is a picture before starting uh, cyclosporin and steroids, and this is a picture two months uh, after. And we can notice there is um, early signs of uh, starting healing is ulcer, which is a good sign. Uh, prior to hyperbaric auction, a CT chest was done and revealed bilateral interstitial lung disease in the lower loops, and so patient was prescribed ozone therapy instead of hyperbaric auction. Uh, in the 5th of October 2022, during ozone session, patients suffer severe headache, mainly uh, occipital. Blood pressure was measured at that time, and it was 220 over 110. So we, we, uh, she was referred to the uh, emergency department. Uh, during uh, her admission to the emergency department, she experienced generalized tonic chronic fits, followed by post ectal confusion. And she was admitted to the ICU at Rabah al Adawiyah Hospital. And the labs at that time revealed that creatinine 10.7 milligram per deciliter. And the last record of creatinine was um, in March 2022 was 0.6. Uh, urea was 470 milligram per deciliter, potassium was 6.5, hemoglobin was 6, platelet was uh, 80 thousands, and there was metabolic acidosis. <coughs> uh, CT brain was done, um, and it, was, it was normal. Patient received the fourth session of hemodialysis at that time with control of blood pressure, and she received also three packed uh, RBCs. And then uh, she was referred to our hostel for further management. Uh, and she reported um, um, progressive lower limb edema and uh, decrease in urine output about 600 uh, cc per day before uh, admission to our hostel. <laughs> uh, on examination uh, at our hospital, uh, she was generally fair. Um, she was conscious, alert, oriented, time present person. Uh, she was um, obese, BMI was 31, 
she has a rounded face, cushionoid face. Uh, she uh, also she was pale, but no jaundice or cyanosis. On examination of her hand, she has hard vacuole seen on, a, uh, on the dorsum of right middle finger, which mostly uh, uh, represent calcinosis, as uh, uh, shown in this figure. Um, no skin tightness elicited at that time. Uh, her blood pressure uh, was 150 over 80. Um, GVB was normal. Uh, chest and heart was uh, unremarkable. Abdomen was lax. Um, no organomegaly um, elicited. <coughs> also, there, there was bilateral soft uh, lower limb um, edema above knee with uh, the large uh, painful ulcer on the right chin as described before. Investigations uh, at that time, uh, urine analysis revealed album plus one, YBCs five to seven, RBCs five to seven, no cast. Uh, Brotnoria was eight gram per gram, protein crat ratio. Um, CBC showed the anemia and the thrombocytopenia. Um, Combus test direct and direct were negative. Uh, Retix corrected with 8.7%. Chestocytes were positive, but few. Uh, and the chemistry showed creatinine um, uh, 9.5, BUN 109, um, albumin 2.7, a slight uh, corrected calcium 8.2. There is were high phosphorus, uh, CRB was raised, LDH was moderately raised, also ASR was mildly raised. Um, as regard the serology, virology was negative as regard HTV, HBV, and HIV. Um, NA uh, was positive, homogenous. But ANCA BC uh, complement uh, were normal, and anti SL70 again was positive, but anti syndromere were negative. Uh, BTH was 123. Uh, the imaging, the kidney and ultrasound were uh, uh, normal size, bilateral grade 2 nephropathy, bright hematomegaly. As regards the uh, echocardiography finding with uh, good ejection fraction 61, uh, the steric dysfunction grade 1. Uh, there uh, was normal uh, LV wall thickness. There was no uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, mild mitral regurg, trivial trapezoid regurg with normal RBSP. <coughs> so in summary, we have 42-year um, Sudanese patient diagnosed with systemic sclerosis years ago, uh, kept on MMF plus nifedibin. She developed two years later by derma gangrenosum, and she was prescribed by saprosporin and high-dose oral steroids. And shortly after, she developed malignant hypertension uh, plus EKI plus thrombotic microangiopathy. So our differential diagnosis at that time, the first differential was a scleroderma renal crisis. The second differential was thrombotic microangiopathy secondary to cyclosporin. But the scleroderma renal crisis was the first and the main differential at that time. So uh, we started hemodialysis for the patients uh, and based on the, uh, our assumption of scleroderma renal crisis, <coughs> we started ACE inhibitor added to her antihypertensive medication and we discontinue beta blocker and it's aggravate, uh, uh, known to aggravate the vasospasm and the steroid dose was reduced to 40 milligram per day. <coughs> and this was her medication. At that time, issue blocker, steroid 40 milligram, ramipril 5 milligram, um, uh, nifedibin, um, uh, amlodibin 10 milligram, uh, aldomet to 150 milligram three times daily, uh, doxazosine four, uh, four milligram uh, twice daily, IV diuretics and uh, teratam. Um, question raised at that time um, uh, uh, that any rule for renal biopsy for this patient or the diagnosis is clear, we can manage um, uh, based on our assumption of scleroderma crisis, and the, there is no rule of biopsy. Also, second uh, uh, question raised is any rule for plasma exchange based on the finding of thrombotic microangiopathy uh, uh, or clinical data of thrombotic microangiopathy in this patient. Uh, other uh, uh, third question: uh, any rule for other immunosuppressive agents that may improve uh, the recovery of the patient or not? Uh, renal biopsy was done <coughs> after discussion with our senior uh, uh, professors um, that it may uh, be uh, uh, beneficial to confirm the diagnosis. 
Um, it revealed eight gomeruli. The gomeruli showed uh, mainly blood stuffed as well as mesangiolysis and the capillary basement brain thickening with peripheral duplication. Uh, as shown as this figure, all gomeruli uh, uh, almost uh, show large hyalur fibrin thrombi, fibrin thrombi as the hilum. Um, also, in this figure, uh, 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 mason trichrome stain showing um, mildly affected tubular system uh, compartments, but also it revealed <coughs> higher uh, fibrin thrombi and, uh, in the arterioles and segmental sclerosis in the glomeruli. As regards the uh, arteries, it showed mucoid intimal degeneration with marked endothelial uh, uh, swelling and the marked lumen narrowing, as shown in this uh, uh, picture. And uh, there was red cell fragmentation and fibrin thrombi. This is a picture uh, may be like the onion skin appearance, but not, not the typical or classic uh, uh, pattern. Uh, Congo rate were negative. Uh, minus chemistry uh, for IgA, IgG, C3 also were negative. So the diagnosis was uh, uh, based on light microscopy and immunobroxylase finding was compatible with thrombotic mic and consistent with ischioderma renal crisis. So we managed the patient as uh, uh, based on that as a ischioderma renal crisis. Um, I will uh, just speak uh, 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 briefly about uh, uh, highlights on uh, uh, the case, some points in the case. Uh, first, uh, the scleroderma renal crisis as a definition, there is no generally accepted uh, 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 definition. <coughs> the accepted one is new, no, new onset or raised blood pressure. Also, blood pressure can be normal, which we call it normal tensive renal crisis, uh, together with progressive elevation of serum creatinine. Additionally, there may be microangiopathic traumatic anemia, thrombocytopenia, retinate changes, and new onset proteinuria or hematuria, pulmonary edema, and characteristic changes on renal biopsy. What are the risk factors to develop uh, scleroderma renal crisis? The main risk factor uh, that was present in this case is the early disease diagnosed in the first four years uh, after diagnosis, after seven, four, uh, mean duration of 7.5 months up to four years, and the glucocorticoid use is the main risk factor to develop uh, such uh, uh, condition. Together with other features like diffuse cutaneous subtype, rapidly progressive skin involvement, and tendon uh, uh, friction wraps, and other markers, I will speak uh, uh, about it in the next slide. This review article is uh, uh, um, uh, discuss the importance of autoimmune markers to uh, 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 predict the occurrence of scleroderma crisis, mainly the anti -RNA, uh, RNA polymerase type three antibodies and the anti tubo isomerase one, including anti-SL70, which was positive in the patient, and also the presence of anti centurion antibodies uh, uh, considered protective against the development of scleroderma renal crisis, and it was negative in, the, in this patient. Uh, what are the differential diagnoses of scleroderma renal crisis? Mainly ANCA uh, vasculitis, malignant hypertension, drug-induced renal injury, complement dysregulation, hemolytic chromic syndrome, thrombocytopenic uh, uh, thrombotic thrombotropenic purpura and transplant rejection. <coughs> How can we differentiate a scleroderma renal crisis from ANCA vasculitis? Uh, first, uh, the onset uh, 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 scleroderma renal crisis mainly occurs in the, in the diffuse uh, uh, cutaneous type, while ANCA vasculitis occurs mainly in the limited cutaneous type. Uh, scleroderma renal crisis uh, is associated with malignant hypertension, while, uh, while the blood pressure is mildly elevated in, in, in ANCA vasculitis usually. The renal failure and the hypertension uh, is acute onset uh, uh, in uh, scleroderma renal crisis, while it's, it's so acute in uh, presentation in the ankle vasculitis. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, that the, the, the renal crisis, uh, scleroderma renal crisis, usually develop uh, after 7.5 months up to four years, in the first four years uh, of the disease, while the ankle vasculitis typically occur uh, late uh, after uh, uh, systemic sclerosis. Uh, second point is the uh, ACE inhibitor is the first line of treatment in this uh, pseudomonas renal crisis, while does not uh, uh, affect the management in ankle vasculitis. Uh, the last point that steroids more than 15 milligrams per day are one of the major risk factors to develop pseudomonas renal crisis, and that's what happened with our patients. But uh, otherwise, uh, uh, on the other hand, the uh, uh, steroids are one of the line of treatment of ankle vasculitis. This is a nice algorithm 
uh, illustrated in this article, sorry, uh, about the state of the art management of uh, scleroderma crisis. Uh, <coughs> they stated that S inhibitor are the main line of treatment, preferably Taptoprel. Uh, we have to start them earlier. Uh, and the treatment goal to normalize blood pressure in the first 72 hours. If blood pressure not controlled, we can add other uh, 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 medication like calcium channel blocker or diuretics or alpha blocker. And uh, they mentioned that if there is a, a, a finding of thrombotic myocarditis, we may use plasma exchange. Um, if there is a progressive worsening of uh, GFR and uh, considering the serum finding and the worsening finding, we can uh, add uh, endothelial receptor antagonist or eclizumab. Uh, and if there is uh, uh, improvement of GFR, we can continue on uh, endothelial receptor antagonist and S inhibitor. If there is no improvement, uh, the patient will uh, end by dialysis. If the uh, GFR is stable, we will uh, continue on S inhibitors. Uh, and after uh, being on dialysis, we have to wait for at least 12 months uh, before considering renal transplantation. This is a very important point I will uh, raise uh, later on. As regards the plasma exchange, <coughs> it was traditionally uh, uh, used to treat uh, systemic sclerosis uh, on the hypothesis that uh, there was a humoral factors uh, might play a uh, role in the muscle genesis of the disease, but this is not proven in uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, and uh, uh, based on the guidelines of uh, American Society of Apheresis, the plasma exchange considered category three, which means optimum rule uh, 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 not established. Okay, uh, another important uh, question. Can we prophylax against scleroderma renal crisis? If the patient uh, of uh, 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 systemic sclerosis, uh, can we give them uh, uh, ACE inhibitor early before development of scleroderma renal crisis? Is it protective? The answer <coughs> uh, can be uh, uh, shown from this uh, uh, multiple uh, studies that there is no benefit from S inhibitor. Uh, and not just that, it's, uh, uh, the use of S inhibitor is associated with <laughs> toward, <laughs> is, uh, toward uh, worse outcome. Uh, when we uh, uh, compare patients that use S inhibitor before development of scleroderma crisis and S inhibitor, <laughs> Uh, 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 patients that use S inhibitor and the patients that did not, did not use S inhibitor, we will find that more patient uh, on dialysis in the S inhibitor group and uh, uh, less patient uh, that have uh, recovery on the S inhibitor group. So the conclusion that S inhibitor is not protective against uh, uh, development of scleroderma renal crisis if we prescribe them early uh, to the patients. Ahmed. Uh, uh... Just uh, to highlight that, uh, what is the final situation of the patient? Uh, did we have uh, plasma exchange or not? Just to conclude and uh, open the discussion. I, I have also uh, one, one or two slides, uh, I will, and I will, I will finish. Uh, another question, uh, and I will, I will mention the, the final state of the patient. Another question about the renal, uh, renal recovery. If the patient asked me, uh, can my kidney recover after the development of renal crisis? The answer can be uh, uh, taken from this uh, uh, review that the patient has 24% chance that he can recover his renal function. And this recovery can happen uh, 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 up to two years after development of scleroderma renal crisis. So, so the, the, the conclusion or whole message that we have to be patient before deciding that the patient is in this stage of disease. Uh, up to and what is our plan? Did we had uh, plasma exchange uh, and what no, is the no, current the patient, situation? The, the patient was kept on AC inhibitor. We, we increased the dose of Ramipril and we kept him on dialysis. She uh, uh, traveled back to Sudan and she is on dialysis till now. And we are contacting her regularly. She's still not recovered yet. Uh, how, how long it last from uh, uh, from the discharge from our unit, yeah, I mean, from October, uh, uh, for, uh, from, from October till now, it is about uh, two months. Uh, so the patient did not recover up till now. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Very illustrative and very uh, important uh, point. Uh, <laughs> you highlight. Like, uh, I, I will keep the I will keep the Professor uh, uh, Mohammed Sobha for just commenting. And if there is any question, uh, please. I would like to thank first uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid our great uh, ambassador uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, he catches the diagnosis very early 
uh, that it is a scleroderma uh, crisis. And also, Ahmed, you highlight that there is no preventive strategy to start SNF or to prevent uh, the crisis of uh, systemic sclerosis and renal crisis. So if uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mohamed Sop uh, give uh, us uh, your opinion on the management and uh, if we have the correct way of renal biopsy or we cannot, so we can hear from your side. Actually, Dr. Ahmed Amara did a very good and excellent presentation and gave us a lot of details, not only regarding the case and um, uh, how he reached the diagnosis, but also gave us a background of uh, updated information. Uh, so the case is very clear, managed very well. Uh, the point is that, uh, again, plasma exchange. Uh, and if there is a, a factor which uh, made this patient go to thrombotic microangiopathy, uh, if there is a moral factor, I think plasma exchange is a logic indication, but it seemed from the literature that there was no difference between those treated and not treated by plasma exchange as I understood from Ahmed. Uh, a second point is for how long uh, to say, he said it, uh, uh, this is an end stage and we have to proceed for transplantation. He say we have to wait up to two years, uh, yes. which is sometimes difficult to keep the patient for two years to decide to do transplantation or not. And what about after transplantation, the recurrence? What about the recurrence? We need him to yes, give uh, us- I, I, I just highlighted it in the last slide about transplantation. It's mentioned in the literature uh, reported recurrence up to 20% uh, in the graph, but maybe less percentage in other uh, uh, studies. It is actually difficult to uh, diagnose and distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, uh, after occurrence. Uh, uh, but it is still uh, uh, there that there is a percentage of recurrence. But also the a very important point that we have to wait at least 18 months uh, after the development of the renal crisis before uh, referring the patient for transplantation. And I think you have to do biopsy, for a biopsy. Uh, uh, yes, I think we, if, if we have a clinical suspicion that the patient uh, 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 have high blood pressure or uh, evidence of uh, TMA, we can proceed for biopsy. But I think routine biopsy, uh, uh, we have no consensus to do that. Uh, I mean, uh, the patient like on dialysis to say he, he is in this stage and go to transplantation. You you do serial biopsy, let us say after six months, uh, uh, every other <laughs> and so on. Uh, uh, yes, maybe, or maybe, or may depend on the clinical data, the urine output and serum creatinine. Um, yeah, yes, you're as, they, as they, they mentioned that the vascular, uh, 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 the I think the vascular clinical data and yes. clinical data will guide us for the renal recovery. Yes, yes, yes. So okay. renal biopsy may be for uh, academic <laughs> prognosis, but I think we are uh, just uh, adherent to the uh, dialysis process and uh, waiting for mm. even partial uh, recovery that I doubt uh, for mm. uh, there. But question to Professor Mohammed Sop, do you yeah. think that uh, the scleroderma like lupus permit out after starting dialysis? Uh, from the uh, answer of Dr. Ahmed, you say recurrence is uh, 28%, which is not uh, there with lupus. The yes, recurrence exactly. with lupus. Yeah, so lupus is actually burned out, but as such, scleroderma is not. Exactly. The is so high as such. So we have to wait for a longer period, keeping the patient on the maximum dialysis uh, adequacy, yes. treating all the metabolic profile, controlling of her blood pressure, uh, keeping the patient away from blood transfusion. Whatever the ESA doses could be of uh, aggravating hypertension should be in our uh, remarks because ESA doses here may aggravate their blood pressure. So uh, give the ESA and monitor the blood pressure, give mm. the minimum dose of ESA to control, try not to give IV ESA, give it a subcutaneous route and maximize the blood pressure uh, control and homoglobin around 10 
not go uh, over because the patient may be worse uh, in condition by ESA. Uh, we have some question if you allow me, Professor Sopha, to, to share with you that yeah. uh, from Ibrahim Omar, was a pyodine magangrenosum diagnosed with skin biopsy? It's clinical from the clinical uh, presentation and the biopsy says that the granulomatous. Yeah. Second question from uh, Ibrahim as well. Uh, TMA from Protect Micro and Job at the UCNR. Yes, it's common, but uh, the uh, condition here is beyond CNI because it is related mainly to the original disease. Uh, we have also Professor, our friend, uh, Professor oh, Mohammed Abdel Bari. Uh, we have that. What about the skin lesion pyoderma prognosis? I don't have the answer uh, because we uh, lost the uh, follow up of the patient. So, uh, this is, yes. uh, there is a, a question from uh, Dr. Ala, and it was my question, and I think you answered this question, but I want to stress that why biopsy decision was taken, and you said it is was uh, يعني, no indication was to uh, uh, no other lesions are present exclude other lesions, and uh, the, the, the case is straightforward. Any other answer for this? Yes, uh, in this case, exactly, we have uh, highlighted that in our department by the uh, senior professors, uh, renal policy is half and half indicated. If you go to renal policy, you can have the stages and uh, you can have a definite diagnosis. So if you do renal pulse, it's not uh, a big fault, but if you wait, uh, still you are correct. So both conditions, it's okay for me, is that to go uh, renal pulse or to wait, provided that there is no uh, any adverse event uh, from the renal pulse. We uh, conclude that policy may be of value. Okay. We have uh, Professor uh, Riyad Saeed. Professor Andrew, was Saeed, Professor Saeed Hamis wants to comment also. Thank you, Professor Yasser. Thank you, all Perfect. my professors, and thank you, Prof Professor Ahmad Amara. Uh, just, I would like to comment on regarding the first one, is regarding the first comment, I mean, regarding the ACE inhibitors. As you know, it made a breakthrough in the management of this uh, scleroderma crisis, and it was invented intentionally for this aim at the beginning, since a long time. So it decreased the mortality and the morbidity, as you know. And the second uh, comment regarding the aldomet, I don't know still aldomet is prescribed for non-pregnant non hypertensive patient. Why? It can also uh, induce anemia or as a side effect on 20% of the patients. And the patient, I think, has hemoglobin 9. I don't know why the aldomet is there. The third- uh, I agree with you, Professor Said, in the aldomet uh, working like, acting like uh, function. And uh, can, uh, can aggravate hemolysis and hemolytic anemia. And yeah. I think on the uh, further management, we stopped. Uh, I think Ahmed, we stopped the aldomet uh, later on. Uh, we keep it. Uh, it is. It is the last. Uh, the last uh, 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 option we use it. We started with S inhibitor, uh, calcium channel blocker, alpha blocker, and its blood pressure is still high. So we added. Uh, but uh, but, but I, I saw that the dose of S inhibitor was not the maximum tolerated dose. You, you give try this five milligram we, once we, daily. Uh, we, up, we upgraded it to uh, 10 milligram later on. Uh, and still you don't have a control of blood pressure. So now, once now, added, uh, now it is controlled uh, with, uh, with, with, with uh, alpha methyl doba. Yes, yes. We, yeah, yes, uh, I, yeah. I believe that Professor Said has touched a very important point. But if you don't have any uh, uh, other uh, drugs that control blood pressure, we can go for <laughs> alpha methyl drug. Yes. So, third question regarding the, by the way of pregnancy, if this patient in the child bearing period and will ask you or counsel you to get a pregnancy, uh, you, do you agree at that moment or not? Before I, the, I, I think she is not a candidate for pregnancy, probably but after transplantation. But on the current state, we cannot uh, no, I, advise I, the patient to have I, a transplant I, uh, I mean pregnancy. I mean before developing this scleroderma renal crisis. is a quiescent stage of scleroderma 
without scleroderma renal crisis and ask you to get you will agree or not if there is no uh, very dangerous condition of the kidney and the patient is controlled for her blood pressure renal profile and everything is fine and provided the patient is primary grave yeah so she didn't have any child we can offer her uh, with close monitoring as many patients uh, in this situation as a missed uh, or uh, intrauterine fetal death or man intrauterine function so uh, it depends on the social and clinical condition of the patient yeah thank you professor thank you thank you we have also professor riyad said just to conclude on this case and to move to the other case well, thank you i think it was an excellent great case well done i have really one point to ask how you can explain really one plus protein in the urine and then then you have 8 g proteinuria that really doesn't make sense it is usually uh, laboratory uh, finding and uh, we don't consider that the uh, one plus or two plus It is just a highlight in the urine yes. analysis, but we yes. didn't. Yes, we didn't consider oh, yeah. that. Okay. Yes, so it's correct. To me, when I see this, to me, when I see this, I think about paraproteinuria. The condition, the the, the oh. urine, a very important point and educational point to the junior. If you have a patient with creatinine, for example, eight milligram per deciliter, urinary protein creatinine ratio may be falsely high. So better to have a quantitative 24 hours protein because already the urinary creatinine is low. Subsequently, we may have a very high number of proteinuria. So in patients with CKD, advanced CKD, I think 24 hours protein will be more important in such a situation. And Professor Sophie may agree with me on that. On that. Um, also, if you do albumin with creatinine and protein creatinine ratio, if there is a big discrepancy between both, we have to look for uh, paraproteinemia, uh, and we have to do plasma, uh, serum protein electrophoresis. Yes, it's non-selective. You, you, you mean that yeah. non-selective are full of immunoglobulins? Yeah. That's why there is a discrepancy, not the uh, equation of urinary and from creatine to protein creatine. But yeah. I believe that 24 hours protein in such a case will be more uh, more important than a spot sample of urine and protein creatine ratio. It is a gold standard, by the way, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, but the urine and creatine is low, so you can have a very huge number in urinary protein creatine ratio. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we But can... We can uh, thank you, Ahmed Amara. Very important uh, talk uh, uh, highlighted in the case, and uh, you also summarized. And you can move to our second case. Who is next? Stop sharing, Ahmed, please. Uh, I don't find the vote. Uh, uh, our second case today comes uh, by Dr. Arim Sultan, one of the, our new lecturers in the department. She has a very good experience now in the health and hemodiaphyl filtration. I was the supervisor in her thesis and uh, It is actually published in the last uh, American Society of Nephrology, 2022. Uh, Dr. Reem Sultan will highlight the second case as usual. We'll highlight all. We will not interrupt you until the end. Please go ahead with the presentation and very minimal uh, okay. uh, summary at the end. Please go okay. ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank all my professors for giving me this opportunity to share this case. Our case today is about 19 years old male patient, university student with no special habits of medical importance, who was presented to our clinic for assessment for renal transplantation from his uh, mother as a potential donor. His condition started since 2011, when he complained of high-grade persistent fever and then was diagnosed with UTI. His urine analysis showed uh, pastels over 100 RBCs from 15 to 20 and protein plus one. Antibiotics based on urinary culture was given with improvement of his condition 
On follow-up urine analysis, it showed uh, prostate 0 to 5 and RBCs 25 to 30. Uh, Pelvi abdominal ultrasound was done, showing bilateral heavy renal stones, more on the right side, uh, with thick urinary bladder, picture of cystitis. He, uh, he did excretory urography with uh, showing medullary nephrocalcinosis, the delayed renal excretory functions, and CTUT showed also multiple renal parenchymal calcifications, likely involving renal parenchyma, renal pyramid, sorry. The patient was then diagnosed with medullary nephrocalcinosis for further investigation. His lab investigation from 2011 showed normal creatinine with 0.9, uh, normal calcium 9.4, magnesium 0.9, uric acid 7.6, normal serum chloride and PTH uh, elevated 167. Urinary studies showed a normal oxalate to creatinine ratio and elevated calcium to creatinine ratio with 24 hours urinary calcium reaching to 186 milligram per day. The normal to be less than four milligram per kg per day and his body weight was 30. Please slow down in the lab, uh, just on the screen. Come here. Um, okay. uh, he had no normal VBG with pH 7.37 uh, with bicarb 21. The patient was then maintained on oral magnesium replacement therapy and vitamin B6 with regular follow-up of kidney functions, electrolytes, and urine analysis. From 2011 till 2020, the patient's condition remained stationary. Then on a routine follow-up, serum creatinine uh, raised to three milligram per deciliter and continued gradual rising on further follow-ups. Six months later, he was diagnosed with hypertension and was controlled on Norvosc and Cordura. In June 2022, he developed vomiting, hiccup, generalized fatigue associated with bilateral painless uh, pitting lower limb edema with decreased urinary output. He sought medical advice and labs revealed serum creatinine 11 milligram per deciliter <clears throat> and protein to creatinine ratio uh, 4 grams. He then received three successive sessions of hemodialysis. And currently, the patient is on uh, end stage renal disease on regular hemodialysis, three sessions per week, four hours each from a left internal jugular double human tunnel catheter permacath. His past history he had severe myopia since 2005. He had macular scarring since 2007 uh, and silicon injection one year ago due to retinal detachment. Uh, he had the uh, positive consanguinity and the history of similar condition. Uh, male child in his family, in his father's family. Uh, this child condition also started when he was seven years old and he is currently under regular follow-up. The clinical examination when he uh, was presented to us was uh, blood pressure 140 over 70, uh, neck veins wasn't congested and there was no lo lower limb edema. Uh, cardiac, abdominal and chest examination was, uh, was uh, normal. <clears throat> Further investigations were done for determining the etiology of kidney disease for the possibility of renal transplantation. It was in September 2022. The creatinine was 14, uh, magnesium 3.4, PTH 196. Urine analysis showed pastas 10 to 12, RBCs 1 to 2, costanil albumin plus 1. Uh, CBC uh, hemoglobin was 11.4. Protein creat uh, was 5.3 grams. Uh, immune markers were done. Uh, they were negative. Virology were also negative. This lab uh, prior to dialysis or on dialysis? Uh, prior to the, yani, uh, he was on dialysis, but not, uh, uh, not regularly. Then he was raised to three times per week. Okay. So we have a differential diagnosis for nephrocalcinosis. Uh, uh, if we classify it according to the uh, type of crystal we have, is was calcium phosphate crystal formation or calcium oxalate? If it was calcium oxalate, then we would uh, think of hyperoxaluria, which is primary or secondary. If it's calcium phosphate, uh, we can think about if uh, hypercalcemia with hypercalciuria, we've, uh, we should think of primary hyperparathyroidism, sarcoidosis, vitamin D therapy, milk alkali syndrome, Wilms syndrome, congenital hypothyroidism. If there is hypercalciuria without hypercalcemia, we should think about distal RCA, medullary sponge kidney, uh, inherited tub uh, tubulopathies, just uh, like uh, Barter's hypomagnesemic hypercalciuric nephrocalcinosis, 
او autosomal dominant hypocalcemia if hypercalciuria with hyperphosphaturia then some of the genetics disease like dance and louis syndrome so uh, when we return to our case uh, first we do urinary creatin to exhalate uh, and calcium blood gases chemistry uh, to exclude hyperexaluria we did 24 hours urinary oxalate which was normal and we uh, took renal biopsy also to uh, exclude any other uh, etiology it was unfortunately inadequate but with uh, four glomeruli which were global glomer uh, glomerulosclerosis we did dna sequencing for primary hyperoxaluria which was uh, uh, no mutation which was normal So we excluded hyperoxaluria. Uh, second, a possibility was Barter syndrome. We excluded because there were, he had normal ABG, normal serum chloride, and normal potassium. Uh, also, we excluded uh, Louis and distal RTA because- uh, But actually, potassium was high and maybe uh, related meant, to diminished GFR. Okay. Yes, uh, I mean from the initial labs in 2011, which okay. was normal. Okay. So we excluded other uh, uh, metabolic acidosis causes like Louis and distal RTA. So we have a normal acid-base balance, which lead us to uh, think between hypercalciuria with hypercalcemia or hypercalciuria with normal calcemia. His serum calcium was 9.4 initially, which was normal, and urinary calcium was high. So we can exclude hyperparthyroidism, a vitamin D uh, ingestion, excessive calcium carbonate, and infantile uh, hypercalcemia. That leaves us to hypercalciuria with normal calcemia. We should look for the no, uh, serum magnesium. Initially, it was 0.8, so it was low. Uh, we can exclude uh, causes uh, with normal magnesium like idiopathic hypercalciuria and then disease. This leaves us with uh, familial hypomagnesemia, hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. To confirm this uh, diagnosis, uh, we did the next generation sequencing of the G. <clears throat> genome, which shows homozygous mistrans variant of Claudine 19 gene, and they diagnosed, uh, confirmed the diagnosis with hypomagnesemia type 5. Hypomagnesemia type 5 is associated, associated with Claudine 19 gene a mutation with renal and ocular involvement. Uh, okay. So briefly, before talking about this syndrome, we have a 19-year-old uh, male patient with nephrocalcinosis, hypercalciuria, and hypomagnesemia. The nephro uh, nephrocalcinosis is known to be generalized deposition of calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate in the kidney. It might be cortical or medullary, and medullary nephrocalcinosis is seen in 98% of the cases. Familial hypomagnesemia, hypercalciuria is an autos autosomal recessive disorder caused by mutation in two uh, members of Claudine gene uh, family, which Claudine 16 and Claudine 19, affects calcium and magnesium renal excretion. In Claudine 19 uh, gene defect, there is severe ocular involvement like this patient we had, he had severe myopia and macular scarring. Ocular involvement uh, includes severe myopia, macular and nystagmus. To reach our diagnosis, uh, or to suspect this diagnosis, we have low magnesium, high urinary calcium, and nephrocalcinosis with elevated PTH levels before the onset of CKD, incomplete distal tubular uh, acidosis, hyper-citrateuria, uh, and hyper sorry, hypocitrateuria and hyperuricemia. And for reaching uh, the definite diagnosis, we should do a renal study, uh, sorry, genetic study. At the time of the diagnosis, many patients would uh, show a marked decline GFR, and this uh, and this disease uh, lead them to be end stage renal disease by second or third decade. About eighty percent of plasma magnesium is filtered through glomeruli, and majority of which is uh, reabsorbed by the thick ascending lymph of loop of Henle. Uh, it is uh, it is reabsorbed by a paracellular pathway in the nephron segment. And uh, the Claudine family is uh, in, in, involved in the tight junction protein that uh, has a role in controlling magnesium and calcium permeability of this paracellular pathway. So as we see, if there is a defect in the Claudine protein synthesis, there will be a defect in the reabsorption of magnesium and calcium through the thick ascending uh, limb of the loop of Henle. 
So uh, magnesium is highly affected and causes hypomagnesemia. What is the management? It's continuous oral magnesium supplementation to reduce calcium excretion by thiazides, but these therapeutic strategies haven't shown uh, to significantly influ uh, influence the progression of CKD. Supportive therapy with sufficient fluids and effective treatment of stone formation and bacterial colonization uh, with antibiotics if needed. And finally, kidney transplantation doesn't result in recurrence of the disease because the primary defect resides in the kidney. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Reem. It's very clear. Although it's very rare as well, uh, because we don't see uh, a lot of cases of uh, such uh, uh, genetic uh, disease. So uh, uh, I, I invite uh, Professor Sok just to highlight the important message in this talk uh, from this case scenario. It seems that that's very rare. What, what's your uh, expertise in these uh, cases, Professor Sok? Stop sharing. Professor Sokka, please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, actually, this is a, a difficult uh, situation. Rare diseases, which uh, usually we, review, we, we, we study it again, we read it again, but we, due to a lack of uh, practice, since it is a very uncommon or rare, usually we forget this basic information. So when we have a case, like this, we have to go again and read uh, 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 up to date. And actually this subject, I read it, I think uh, two months ago uh, with these complex uh, electrolyte disorder in blood and urine and uh, genetic. But by time, uh, always we forget. So we have to read it again. Uh, it is a rare condition. Uh, it is very interesting case presented very well uh, by Reem. Uh, I add uh, uh, no more uh, can I add to what she said. So the clue of diagnosis here is the presence of nephrocalcinosis plus hypomagnesemia. Uh, yeah. Yes, we have to go through the genetic and from the last statement of Reem that no contraindication of transplantation in this case. Because yeah. the, the gene deficiency, uh, deficiency is on the native kidney, not on the transplanted kidney. Yeah, so yeah. we don't expect it to uh, recover. So uh, any, uh, any of uh, our professors who professor need to Faisal comment? Shaheen, uh, professor Faisal Shaheen wants to comment to Professor Ishaan. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, you. I didn't see the uh, full... Thank professor you, Faisal Shaheen. Thanks, yes, yes, thanks, yes, uh, Excellent case, and uh, I wonder how many of us saw such cases in his life, even his career, during his career. So it's a very difficult case, but it is very well representative. Uh, and uh, the, the roadmap of the diagnosis was excellent. And uh, uh, actually, we learned from such cases every now and then, as uh, Dr. Subhi said, we have to review ourselves to look for what is the cause of this. And but my my question is actually the age limit of such case when it's happening either it's happening in a kid in adult or in later or it's happening in all ages. Probably this is my my my, my question. So it's uh, it's just started in the childhood, but uh, I think in the end stage comes into the adulthood, early adulthood uh, stages. Although there is a very scarce uh, of the information on such cases. I think, Kareem, if you read any of the literature defining the uh, age of uh, presentation and the age of presenting to end stage kidney disease, we are welcoming your answer. Uh, and stage reaches by the second or third decade uh, of, the, of the patient, any yani, uh, early 20s till uh, 30s, early 30s. Very good. Yes. So there is no preventive strategy, even at the early diagnosis, you give uh, magnesium oral and you keep the patients on thiazide, for example, to decrease hypercalcuria, but the progress is inevitable. Uh, yes, there, there, was no definite, uh, there was no definite studies that this uh, strategies will, pre will prevent the CKD progression and the progression to end stage. So uh, let us ask Professor Faisal, I think this patient can have a do donation uh, from her parents because they don't have any 
of the abnormality in their renal profile. So uh, do you think that Professor Chain that if the mother, for example, want to donate, do you agree on that? Well, yes, I think uh, uh, since there is no recurrence of the disease after uh, kidney transplantation, so probably the ideal, especially those people, uh, as it's mentioned by Dr. Neem, that it come for when they are celsius or something. So still they are young and they have long way to go in their life. So probably the ideal thing is to get transplantation, especially if there is no recurrence of the disease. So uh, whatever the parents have a normal renal profile, no yes. calcinosis, they are free, they can do. My last question is maybe some of the, uh, our scope on that. The clodine is well as well in the intestinal villus and the spinal mucosa and probably may have an ad, uh, disadvantage of the translocation of endotoxin through the clodine and uh, the thigh junction. So any of the literature describe any abnormality in the GIT as well, for example, recurrent fever, endotoxemia, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, regarding clodine 16 or 19, I didn't read uh, any GIT effect. It's mainly- Although the clodine protein is important in the trans, uh, in, in the spinal thigh junction. So uh, this patient is uh, nowadays under the program of transplantation for them um, uh, living related and we hope yes, that to... actually uh, actually he underwent uh, renal transplantation Ready, uh, okay yes and he's doing well his lost creatinine is 1.1 uh, how this, long um, after transplantation uh, this is uh, yani the he transplanted in november 2022 that's uh, the second month okay thank you very much Reem. thank you and uh, uh, we... to show my own to clarify a point please uh, yeah. You said that uh, living related can be done, and uh, how can we judge that there is no possibility of the presence of uh, the, G the abnormality in the body, the donor that might appear later on? Uh, so the uh, the gene is the uh, the patient uh, renal profile, renal uh, function, the nephrocalcinosis and the hypomagnesemia is related to the native gene, not uh, transmitted from the parents themselves. Because if they are present in the parents, we, we can have the same presentation from the parents. Mm. So it is not uh, like the other hereditary autosomal from the parents transferred to the, uh, their offspring. Otherwise, you, you may have his brother, his mother may suffer sometimes if you see that it's autosomal recessive, uh, you can find a lot of patients in the category from the same family. Okay, thank you. You have two comments on the chat. If you check, primary about from Dr. Omar and the Professor Tarat Antawi, uh, about primary hyperparathyroidism was excluded, Dr. Ibrahim. Primary hyperparathyroidism was excluded based on normal serum calcium. It can be normal calcemic hyperpara or hypercalcemic with normal PTH? I think this is a comment, not a question. I think uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, would, would do uh, hypercalcemia in the primary case and yes. hypercalcemia for sure. But here sure. we have hypercalcemia with normal calcemic, elevated PTH may be related to end stage kidney disease. And it is not, it's double normal, it is not <clears throat> a huge elevation. And Dr. Tarek Tantawi asked about native nephrectomy. Uh, I think that there is no separation, infection, refluxing uh, to do native nephrectomy. Uh, I disagree that it may be of value. Okay. Uh, Professor Sop, uh, no more comments and no more uh, questions. On the uh, nephrectomy is indicated if uh, it was a case of uh, prime. Uh, 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 systemic uh, primary oxenosis. Yes, exactly. But in this setting, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you, Reem, very much. Uh, as usual, you thank are you. one of the new stars uh, shining in Champs University. Hopefully that when you are reaching professor, I will be alive to thank you again uh, for this long journey from uh, residents to be a professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. It's, a, it's an honor to be my professor.
Thank, Thank you. you very much. So we have uh, our last case coming from, I think, Dr. Amarwa Shaban. Uh, thank you again for being patient with us for this last case to, uh, tonight. And after learning from uh, Ahmed Amara and from Reem Sultan, we are going to finalize our meeting tonight by Dr. Salma Fathi, uh, one of the looking great professors uh, in the future. She is now lecturer of internal medicine in the Anshams University Department. She is active and uh, she is also very conscious and very cooperative to our team in the educational mission. Dr. Salma will highlight, improve the third case and we'll go back again to discussion later on. Please go Salma. Thank you, Dr. Hashim, thank you. Uh, our case today, it is a 47 year old male patient married for 19 years with two offspring. The youngest is 15 years old. He is born and lives in, in Monofea. He used to work as a wood painter He's a cigarette smoker for 20 years of one pack per day. He, uh, his complaint was swelling of both lower limbs of two years duration. Uh, his history begins in uh, February 2021 when the patient started to suffer from progressive bilateral lower limb edema and puffiness of the eyelids. Uh, there was no hematuria, dysuria, or oliguria, or uh, manifestations of uh, dysnea or orthopnea. Uh, no history of jaundice or right hypochondrial pain or arthritis. He sought medical advice and he was prescribed a uh, di diuretic in the form of torsemide, 10 milligram once per day, uh, and non specific treatments with partial improvement of the edema. However, in March 2022, uh, the edema progressed again with abdominal enlargement uh, associated with scrotal edema and puffiness of eyelids. Uh, he was admitted. Uh, in, uh, in Monofea, investigated and received IV diuretics and IV albumin with partial improvement. Investigation. So, so the, edema, uh, the edema was diagnosed by non nephrologist and managed empirically by diuretic without going through uh, investigation as a nephrology case. Exactly? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Okay, okay. Uh, investigations done uh, in a hepatology department. Uh, urine analysis was show, uh, showed uh, YBCs 6 to 8, RBCs 55 to 60, and album 3 plus. However, they did not uh, go behind uh, uh, after that. Uh, they did other investigations that like album creatinine ratio 4 gram per gram. Uh, his creatin, serum creatinine was 1.1. However, the serum album was 2.3. Uh, uh, his biomarkers were negative for C antibody, BS antigen, and HIV antibody. Uh, his hemoglobin was 12.4 and the platelets were normal and the INR was 1. Acetic sampling was done and the album in the acetic fluid was 0.6. The SAG ratio was calculated. It was 1.8, more than 1.1, uh, indicating a portal hypertensive course. Uh, pelvic abdominal ultrasound was done there, showing bright hepatomegaly without cirrhosis and accidental discovery of chronic portal vein thrombosis with cavernous transformation. Uh, there was mild ascites. Uh, there, they did upper uh, upper GI endoscopy. It showed small non-risk esophageal varices, uh, and they did not do any banding. He lost follow-up for six months, how, and he was kept on oral frosimide and spironolactone with liver supports with partial improvement in the edema. In October 2022, he sought medical advice, but this time with a nephrologist. Uh, for the proteinuria, who ordered a renal biopsy and prescribed him torsemide again, 10 milligram once per day. And he came to Edmundash Nephrology Clinic in November with the renal biopsy result. There was no history suggestive of collagen manifestations. He was an analgesic abuser, no history of recurrent UTI or stone passage, and no history of COVID vaccination. His uh, past medical history, uh, appendectomy was done uh, 15 years ago. A hydroselectomy was done 12 years ago. No diabetes or hypertension. Uh, the family history, his mother was end-stage renal disease, mostly due to diabetic nephropathy. His father was hypertensive and no similar conditions or malignancies. On examination, the patient was seen conscious. In our uh, department, he was seen uh, conscious. Alert oriented, his body weight was 70 kilogram. Uh, the BMI was 25.7. There was no pallor. The blood pressure was 130 over 70. 
and the neck veins were not congested, but, but there was bilateral low limb soft pitting edema below the knees with no change in the skin color or temperature. The chest uh, was heard normal, normal physical breathing, and uh, there were no murmurs on the heart. The abdomen was lax, but there was hepatomegaly and dull troops area and no shifting dots. His urine output at the admission was 1.2 liter per day. Investigations were done in our department. Again, the serum creatinine was one, the albumin was two, uh, uh, the hemoglobin was normal and the INR was normal. Uh, we repeated the urine analysis. It showed uh, albumin three plus and RBCs five to six and the pro protein creatinine ratio was eight gram per gram. We did a lipid profile. It was high for the total cholesterol, triglycerides and LDL and low for the HDL. We did alpha fetoprotein, it was normal, and CAA, and it was normal. The renal biopsy result, it showed a membranous nephropathy, secondary, uh, mostly secondary, for uh, anti-pillar antibody and immunological markers to exclude systemic lupus. There was acute tubular injury, mild chronic and tubular interstitial nephritis, and mild to moderate vascular changes. Here we show the uh, HNE uh, images, uh, it showed mild to moderate mesangial hypercellularity as there, and along with moderate uh, capillary wall thickening as uh, seen like here. There was renal tubular uh, injury as mentioned here, and there was interstitial tissue infiltration with edema and inflammatory cells. The uh, electron microscopy showed full house of the electron dense deposits, sub epithelial, as showed here, and mesangial. And there was uh, 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 intramembranous, and there is where a fusion of 60% of the epithelial cell food process. Immune stains there was IgG uh, positive and C3 diffuse granular capillary wall staining, IgM and IgA was trees. We repeated the ultrasound in our department for the portal vein, and it was, again, there is chronic portal vein thrombosis, and the liver was homogenous, not cirrhotic, and enlarged. But the kidneys were both enlarged with normal uh, ecogenicity. We did echocardiography, and it was normal, no intracardiac masses. Uh, we did a GIT consultation, which uh, said it is a case of non serotic portal vein thrombosis, maybe due to nephrotic syndrome or any other causes of thrombophilia, and they ordered a new upper GI endoscopy to, uh, uh, before starting anticoagulation for possibility of bending of the virus. Uh, this uh, uh, slide showing causes of non serotic portal vein thrombosis in the hepatology department, they follow this. It may, the causes may be acquired or inherited prothrombotic disease as a myeloproliferative uh, neoplasm, antiphospholipid, PNH, uh, inherited like factor V leading mutation, protein C or S or antithrombin 3 uh, deficiency. Uh, there may be local factors, abdominal, or the use of oral contraceptive pills, or pregnancy, or Behcet, or celiac, or HIV. So, we did uh, a further workup in, uh, in our department. A new upper GI endoscopy was done. It is the same small non risky viruses, and there was no need for banding. We did, because of the full house dense deposits for secondary membranous nephropathy, we did lupus markers. The ANA was negative, and the anti DNA was negative. The C3 was mildly consumed. And for the antiphospholipid as a cause of thrombophilia in this patient, we did the, the lupus uh, antiphospholipid antibody profile, and it showed it uh, as it is positive for the triple antibodies, the lupus anticoagulant, the antiphospholipid, and the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein. So our case is, uh, is a 47-year-old male patient with a nephrotic syndrome of two years duration. He was diagnosed with secondary membranous glomerular nephritis and chronic portal vein thrombosis. Further workup revealed most probably primary antiphospholipid syndrome with triple anti -posit uh, antibody positivity for long-term anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonist as the preferred one. And for a definite diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome, you need to repeat the antiphospholipid profile after three months. So the antiphospholipid syndrome 
is uh, the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia worldwide. It may be, it can be primary or secondary to underlying disease as the lupus. It needs a criteria to be achieved to diagnose it. And the Sydney criteria for antiphospholipid, which is the updated Sapporo criteria uh, done in 2006, uh, reveals that if you want to diagnose definite antiphospholipid, you need at least one clinical and one lab criteria to achieve this. The clinical criteria may be vascular thrombosis, arterial or venous or small vessel. The pregnancy morbidity can be either uh, any of the three, the following three, either uh, more than one fetal death uh, uh, before 10 weeks of gestation or one or more premature birth before 30 weeks uh, of gestation or more than or equal three successive pre-embryonic losses before the uh, 10th week of gestation. Uh, the laboratory criteria, it is the loop, uh, maybe can be the lupus anticoagulant to be positive in two or more occasions, at least 12 weeks apart, and this is important, or the anticardiolipin antibody, or the N-beta-2 glycoprotein, I, I, any of these must be positive in two or more occasions, at least 12 weeks apart. There is another thing, the risk stratification of the antibody, uh, antiphospholipid antibody profile. There's a, there is a high risk and a low, a low risk. The high risk is, can be uh, said if, you have, uh, if there is a lupus anticoagulant positive in two or more occasions at least 12 weeks apart, or double antiphospholipid antibody positivity, either lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin or anti uh, anti uh, lupus anticoagulant with anti-beta to glycoprotein or triple positivity for the three or the presence of persistently high anti one antibody. The low risk anti antibody profile is isolated one antibody to be positive in a low or medium tetra or transiently positive. So what is about the antiphospholipid syndrome and the kidney affection? It can manifest as hypertension or renal artery stenosis or thrombosis or renal vein thrombosis or ischemic nephropathy or an item called antiphospholipid syndrome nephropathy, which may be manifested as acute TMA thrombotic microangiopathy or chronic intravascular vasculopathy or glomerulonephritis as in our case, which is rare, uh, maybe primary as membranous, which is the most common or secondary to lupus. Renal infarction, uh, or cortical necrosis or vascular access thrombosis in a dialysis patient or in case of transplantation, de nouveau or relapse of the antiphospholipid syndrome nephropathy in the allograft or renal vein thrombosis or renal artery thrombosis or catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, which is a multi-organ failure or pregnancy-related preeclampsia. So what is about the antiphospholipid syndrome nephropathy? It is a renal small vessel vasculopathy, which can be clinically manifested as isolated arterial hypertension or microscopic hematuria, proteinuria, acute kidney injury, or a slow progressive form of chronic kidney disease. And this is a histology slides taken from the University Hospital of Tenon in Paris. It shows the acute or chronic lesions that happen in antiphospholipid syndrome nephropathy, which can be glomerular TMA, here it is stain, thrombotic microangiopathy platelet thrombi stain with a specific stain anti-CD61 or glomerular TMA as shown here also, or arterial TMA, or even arteriosclerosis in the form of antimal hyperplasia up to occlusion of the arteriole and cortical atrophy. So the AP, uh, the antiphospholipid let us, let us go directly. What is the uh, prognosis of our case? Then we'll open the discussion because you highlight a lot of questions on this case. So we can stop here for the uh, literature on antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, what's your patient started? What treatment and what is the follow-up just to have before opening the discussion? Yes, uh, he was kept on long-term anticoagulation warfarin vitamin K antagonist, uh, trying to adjust his INR between two or three, and he is kept on ACE or ARBs. He is on ACE, uh, Ramiprel, uh, and we are following his proteinuria. Uh, the last one is 10 gram, still high, but we are not uh, still not achieving that target INR, which is two to three, because we are uh, increasing the dosage of the warfarin uh, 
prog uh, progressively. I think Sam uh, has an uh, has an a question in the next slide. Yes, uh, you want to raise about the yes. use for misoppression? Yes, we will highlight that in the question. So thank you very much, Salma. Keep keep online because we may have your opinion uh, from your last reading. Uh, this case, I think we raised before that my opinion that there is no randomized controlled trial to give direct oral anticoagulant in such patients or the literature, although difficult controlling the INR uh, but warfarin uh, is the uh, cornerstone in the treatment. And uh, I think we searched for the guidelines that there is no prescribing direct oral anticoagulant. What is missing here is that we then we have uh, a remission of proteinuria or not. We will ask uh, the profession uh, on that. Uh, my, my opinion as well is the portal vein thrombosis is not common at all to be fine uh, unless there is hepatic carcinoma, the major cause of hepatic carcinoma, portal vein thrombosis. But to localize the thrombosis of antiphospholipid in the portal vein, I think this is the very uh, uncommon uh, site uh, for uh, uh, patients with antiphospholipid. So we will start the discussion and you can stop sharing uh, Salma. We'll have uh, first opinion from Professor uh, Sop to comment. Yeah, it is very interesting case, especially this combination of portal vein thrombosis and uh, antiphospholipid syndrome and membranes. Yes, membranes is not to occur with antiphospholipid, but it is uncommon, as you said, regarding this uh, portal vein thrombosis. But at the end, uh, there, there is double indication of uh, anticoagulation, uh, the antiphospholipid and membranes uh, as an etiology of this uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the patient will be permanently on uh, Marivan or um, uh, this oral anticoagulant. Uh, but the interesting point is immune suppression. Uh, here there is an immune complex uh, deposits uh, in the capillary wall. And I think there is uh, uh, indication to give uh, immune suppression uh, treatment beside uh, oral anticoagulation and anti uh, uh, protocols as a statin, ACE, and ARB, and uh, mineral corticoid inhibitors. And we will see what the literature say regarding giving immune suppression in patients like that by Salma. Yeah. Yes, I think Salma has an answer for this. Question. Yes. Uh, in secondary antiphospholipid, we know that hydroxychloroquine and the immunosuppressor uh, treat uh, drugs of uh, lupus. However, there are uh, three promising treatments like eclozumab and mTOR inhibitors and bilimumab. They are under investigation. Uh, we know in catastrophic antiphospholipid, plasmapharesis and IVIG with pulse steroid are given. However, in the group of antiphospholipid syndrome patients with glomerular disease, there are no studies regarding the treatment with immunosuppression. Probably the best is a combination of immunosuppression of drugs with anticoagulation, but this needs to be supported by a recommendation. And this is in the frontiers immunology. Um, Oh, uh, in Kidney International, August uh, 2016, it explained something that the antiphospholipid uh, antibodies cause thrombosis. So we give anticoagulation and they affect the mTOR pathway with a complement independent uh, uh, pathway causing vasculopathy. So they recommend that they are testing the mTOR inhibitors and they found that the serolimus is, uh, is a good uh, immunosuppressive drugs in this. Uh, and it is under investigation also. Uh, regarding a complement dependent uh, affection, the complement activation causes the TMA. So we do plasma pharesis and the ecolizumab is under investigation. But seromas by itself can cause proteinuria. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Mm. yes. A very interesting case as well, and I think uh, presence of uh, portal vein thrombosis very uncommon. Uh, I memorized that cryoglobinemia 
can induce like Pascal syndrome and they can induce portal vein thrombosis and can induce as well peripheral vascular disease, definitely with uh, kidney disease. Why you don't uh, uh, test for cryoglobulin in this case? Uh, as uh, the uh, HIV antibody was negative, HBS antigen negative, HCV antibody was negative many times. But, but maybe polyclonal or related to monoclonal gammopathy, cryoglobinemia. I think we are uh, we have to test uh, even the cryoglobin once you find the portal vein thrombosis and the kidney affection. But uh, C4 will be very low, and um, uh, I, 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 a rheumatoid factor will be very high if yes. there is a crime. Yes, sure, uh, Professor Sava, but on the uh, workup, in this case from the start, once they found that portal vein thrombosis and the renal yeah. uh, affection, yes. one of the mandatory testing plus antiphospholipid is the serum crack level in title to see that uh, yeah. Because portal vein thrombosis is very, very uncommon beyond hepatic carcinoma. Almost all cases of yeah, hepatic carcinoma, carcinoma ended by portal vein thrombosis, but yes. uh, yeah, uh, uh is not common in portal vein. Uh, also, in cryo, I think uh, it is common to give a vasculitic crash in the lower limbs. Sure. Uh, and uh, it also to be very uncommon to present uh, uh, with uh, this uh, portal vein thrombosis. It is also very uncommon, I think. Yes, sure. Can can induce Pascal syndrome because there is a, a obstruction of yeah. the uh, uh, inferior vena cava just coming from the hepatic vein mm. and described in patients with Pascal. I just uh, I need to mix between the yeah. finding of the uh, GIT. Uh, small viruses, the portal vein thrombosis, and the renal affection. So yeah. we can why the differential diagnosis with cryoglobinemia, but the diagnosis is clear that we have antiphospholipid. Mm. Professor Sofa, do you recommend which type of class if you started uh, immunosuppression? Do you think that uh, it may so change? For the creatinine is normal and proteinuria is heavy, I will start by calcineurin. Calcineurin. Yeah. So we give full dose of neural for this patient. What I about steroids? By, due to this uh, hypoalbuminemia, uh, I will start by small dose calcineurin and gradually increasing the dose and observing if there is no change in serum creatine, I will continue to my target, blood level. Okay, so calcineurin uh, probably is adjuvant therapy plus anticoagulation in this patient? Sure, and possibly I will give steroid as well. And small doses of steroid like 20 milligram uh, per day, or you have to give full doses of steroid like 60 to 80 milligram per day? At the beginning, I start to, with big doses, then gradually when I get a response, gradually decreasing the dose. But with membranous, uh, I will say, uh, uh, cyclosporin is even more important than uh, steroid. Uh, so the uh, main uh, treatment is cyclosporin beside uh, uh, steroid, yeah, yeah. If you allow me just to highlight for uh, all our colleagues, what about the position of cyclophosphamide here? Do you think that 500 milligrams cyclophosphamide every two weeks, potentiality of improvement uh, again, it's the CNI. It could be a good option as well, yes. So we have an alternative, either a patient go by anticoagulation, immunosuppression by CNI, or cyclophosphamide, uh, according to the yeah. schedule of 500 milligrams every two weeks. Yeah, the, yeah. the final is no data for direct oral anticoagulant. <laughs> I think with the uh, antiphospholipid, it is uh, or an anticoagulant, uh, anti vitamin K. Yes, uh, there is no diet. There is no. Uh, <clears throat> no, no, is no it, is, it is preferred to give uh, Marivan than diet. Anti diet no data for the diet or anticoagulant and its yeah, safety. Yeah, Although yeah. easier to control and to treat patients with diet anticoagulant, unfortunately, in such situation, we have to turn back to our friend. Yes. So thank you very much. We have opened the discussion for our colleagues.
Uh, we, have the... we have comments. We have comments on the chat from the Professor Hisham, from okay. uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid, and from Dr. Ibrahim Omar. Uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid uh, said that pregnancy risk is cancelled from criteria 2022. Why both kidneys enlarged around 15 centimeters? What is your comment? I think pregnancy in such a case is not advised. Uh, even if it is a successful pregnancy, may terminate earlier. Uh, especially if the patient is on uh, treatment and uh, immunosuppression, we cannot uh, give. But in all cases, this is a case of male patients, not a female patient in all cases. Why the post kidneys are enlarged? Yes, it's enlarged, but no renal vein thrombosis and no infiltration. So it may be uh, ultrasound based measurements. Not, uh, actually, there is no renal vein thrombosis to uh, have uh, such a larger kidney. Uh, Ibrahim Omar uh, coming to uh, what's an old age three coming to the light, cystisomiasis can induce portal hypertension with or without portal vein thrombosis. Yes, what we leave that in cystomiasis, you will have a very huge splenomegaly because the uh, pre sinusoidal hypertension makes the spleen uh, bigger before uh, going to renal uh, portal vein thrombosis. So absence of a big splenomegaly, huge splenomegaly can exclude uh, cystomyces as a cause of portal hypertension. Uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Zaid, we answered that what is the Peter Marizan or diet or anticoagulant. We go all uh, our agreement to Marizan because there is no sufficient data of the efficacy and safety of diet or anticoagulant in such a case. Uh, again, Dr. Ibrahim is thinking about hyperhomocysteinemia is a frequent cause of thrombophilia. I saw one patient with spontaneous portal vein thrombosis. Yes, it's a probably, but uh, remember that all patients in this stage kidney disease had hyperhomocysteinemia, yet there is no hypercoagulation uh, for uh, those patients related and very resistant to treatment and may need huge uh, uh, volume of folic acid prescribed daily. And uh, unfortunately, the dialysis prescription will not treat hyperhomocysteinemia. So we keep that on the very rare occasion as a cause. Uh, that's on the chat. I that's didn't see any other questions. And we have no more comments, uh, Professor Hisham, and no more questions on the chat. Yes. Professor Sop, uh, I think uh, no more cases. You are good, nice. very good. Good. Okay. Well Hisham done. Can, uh, thank you for your share, Professor Hisham. Uh, Say, uh, uh, thank no you very much for that. I just to message the genius, although all the three cases today are very, very uncommon. What's common is common. Think logic, don't go away from the uh, thinking logic. But if you do have a finding that is very strange, like hypomagnesemia with nephrocalcinosis, don't ignore. Okay. Uh, we reached the end of this very interesting session, uh, this clinical forum by uh, Ain Shams University. It was uh, a big one like uh, the university. And uh, thank you, Professor Hisham, for leading uh, this uh, very active and very promising team and uh, introducing these cases. Thank you, Professor Sobh, for uh, being with us. Um, Professor Muhammad Sobh, special thanks for you for uh, you. leading this session and for your comments and for your share and explaining all the cases in a very smart way and a very uh, useful way for the juniors. Uh, I would like to thank you again all. Thank you all our attendees who shared in the discussion, answered by their questions and comments actively and make it a very fruitful, active session. Excuse me to close this session and meet you next Wednesday, inshallah, in our usual date. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.
Bye-bye. Şükran.